Let's talk about some things. All right. You guys have some drones. We do. But first, as Anthony kind of introduced, you were the editor of Wired, and then you jumped over to start a drone company when drones were still something for nerds and the military. What's that about? What, why, the, why the hell did you do that? Okay, so the story is, is uh, a case of parenting gone horribly wrong. Um, 2007, I've got five kids, and I'm always trying to get them interested in science and technology. My background is, I'm not a journalist, I'm a computational physicist. The, the whole media thing was a bit of a, a zag. Um, so we're playing around with uh, Lego Mindstorms, sure. and uh, the kids are like, that's boring. Can you do anything cooler with Lego robots? And I said, what if they could fly? And the kids are like, how would that work? And I like, literally Googled flying robot. The first result was drone. I was like, hmm, I guess I, I guess a flying robot is a drone. What, what, what year was that? 2007. Okay. 2007, by the way, is the year that hardware, hardware got interesting. And I'll, I'll prove it to you in a minute. Okay. But, um, All right, thanks. So, uh, so Google old flying robot, get out, come up with drone, Google drone, come up with autopilot, and he just did it there with Lego pieces around the dining room table. The kids were utterly unimpressed, and I was like, that was amazing. It actually flew autonomously. That should not be possible. What's going on here? Started a website called DIY Drones you know, to ask what's going on. And what I learned is that 2007 was the year that a bunch of things happened that made hardware accessible. So it was the obvious stuff like 3D printing, Arduino, the maker movement, maker fairs, like, you know, the Wii controller. So the Fitbit guys got a Wii controller. They're like, whoa, what's in here? I sure. wonder if you could put it here. Right. But the big thing, of course, was the iPhone. The iPhone was released in 2007. And it's the guts of a smartphone that made drones possible. So I started with a community. Um, the community started doing software, hardware. And everyone just, you know, just open source stuff. And then the next generation comes along and says, that's amazing, but I have no idea how to print a you know, PCB. Can you just make one for me? And so I, um, I started a little thing on the side. The little thing got a bigger thing. And one day in um, three years ago, we woke up and we had a, a drone factory in Tijuana. Tijuana Drone Factory is a great name for a band, by the oh, way. That's and, fantastic. You know, we had a drone factory in Tijuana by accident doing like, you know, we were doing like out of $5 million a year. And I was like, okay, that's a... That's a company. I think I'm going to take some venture capital, quit my job as the editor of Wired, take over 3D Robotics, and today we're the biggest drone maker in America. So how much capital have you raised so far? $99 million. Do you need more? Yes, please. Of course, right? Yeah. Are, are you looking for more actively right now? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we did, a, uh, we did a Series A through C, which got us into the consumer market. And now the, the market is very quickly moving to the commercial market for a number of reasons having to do with regulatory permission, um, some use cases that are quite clear. And, um, and that's, you know, going from a kind of a consumer electronics business to a SaaS software business is going to be a... It's going to take a lot of funding. So, so what do you see as the biggest hurdle that the industry has to overcome? Uh, so, so right now, if you look out here on the, in, in, the, uh, in the halls of CES, um, the consumer market is commoditizing at absolute light speed. So we've gone from basically the military industrial complex to the shelves of Walmart in three years. Sure. That's never happened before. Right. And the prices have fallen by 50% in seven months. Unbelievable. So it's, a, it's, you know, it's, it's turning into a classic you know, Chinese manufacturing business right now. Um, that's great for a drone, but unfortunately a drone is not enough. Um, as you see with the regulatory front, the FAA wants these drones to have sense and avoid. They want them to have geofencing. They want them to have registration. And suddenly these drones have to be connected to the cloud. They have to have intelligence. And you're going to see a lot of the kind of, you know, the toy folks just wiped out because they don't have a full stack platform. Um, there are some good companies out there that do have a full stack platform. They're going to be able to do that, connect the drone to the phone to the cloud. Then the next bit is going to be, okay, now how do you get beyond the consumer market? Consumer market is one to one. It's by definition a personal drone, so it's a person. But the big market is going to be one to many. You know, so drones that are autonomous, unmanned, you know, unattended, just sensors in the sky. And this, inc this involves a cloud platform working with, consume, you know, with enterprise software, sure. and that's a much harder job. So what, what market is 3D Robotics more bullish at? Is it consumer or this, this industrial that you're talking uh, uh, about? We're, we've always been targeted on the commercial market. It's just the commercial market wasn't ready. So this is following the classic consumerization of the enterprise. So the reason the consumer market took off first is for three things. Number one, it was, it was illegal. So recreational use was allowed, but commercial use was not. Number two, there was a use case, which is video. And in the enterprise market, it's a little less obvious. And number three, there's a retail channel. You sell them on Amazon. Right, right. Um, so, every, so all the smart companies started in the consumer space because that's where you can build a business. It's a $1.5 billion business um, right now, and, you know, it's, it's a real thing. But 
the margins are collapsing in that business. And so I think, you know, why, that, why is that? Is there a specific reason? Just competition. Okay. Um, you know, the actual act of flying a drone is now easy. You can buy a chip, you know, on the streets of Shenzhen that, that'll do that. Plastic, motors, batteries, it looks like anything else. Um, you know, so, but, but the innovation has been very fast. Um, autonomy has been necessary because the consumers are very unsophisticated, so they just want to push a button and have it work. And so it's sure. actually been a very, you've seen the consumer drones innovate much faster than, for example, the military drones. But that market is not, is not going to be economically attractive for long. And so, so that's where you're going to see that companies like ours, which are built around a software stack, are just been, you know, we've been sort of earning our stripes here in the consumer market, but the plan has always been to make this about the data, not the drone. Sure. So are you, do you see yourself eventually exiting manufacturing drones and providing a service? Yeah. So, I mean, the analogy I use is I'm going to pull out my prop here. You know, so, so Google and the Nexus. So the Google's, Google's first Nexus phones, it mm -hmm. made itself. Um, and it did it because the integration between the software and the hardware was necessary to give a kind of an iPhone-like experience. But eventually, sure. the Samsungs and the LGGs and the HTCs got good enough that this one happens to be made by LG. And it's going to take, I don't know, maybe five years before we can assume that the, that the hardware market out there produces drone hardware that's sophisticated enough that you can just put software on it. And then at that point, we would like to be more like Google and provide the software. We're the Android of UAVs, if you will. So can you predict who is going to be the LG in this situation if you want to be Google? Might be LG. Could be. Very good. Who do you see as your biggest competitor then right now? Oh, by far the best uh, drone company in the world right now, and that in includes us, is, is DJI out of, out of China. They are doing everything right. They are, um, you know, I lived in China for four years, and so, you know, it was obvious that China was going to be huge, but everybody kept saying, oh, don't worry about China, they can't do X. There is no X. I, I remember that, yes. Yeah. Sure. It's like, oh, they can't do software, wrong. They can't do design, wrong. They can't do marketing, branding. They can't do globalism. They can do everything. Now, sure. there will come a day when we find their limits. But right now, DJI, among other companies like Xiaomi, are showing that they really can be global companies, and they're using the economies of scale of consumer electronics manufacturing, plus, you know, really quite good global branding to, uh, to do well. But, you know, they are a Shenzhen company, which means that they're essentially a hardware product company. And we're a Silicon Valley company, which means we're essentially a software platform company. And we're betting that long-term software platforms beat hardware products. So the Android ecosystem, we're betting long-term creates more value than the Apple ecosystem, even if Apple itself may have higher margins than any of the Android players. So we're playing the, we're playing the ecosystem game. What about GoPro? Well, GoPro has certainly announced they want to get into the drone business. Um, they're working on it. Uh, right now, they're a great partner of ours. Our, our drone, the Solo drone, is the best GoPro experience because we use the GoPro API sure. and, the, and the connector in the back. So right now, GoPro is our best friend. We love the camera. We control it beautifully from the drone. And, um, you know, go GoPro. Are, are, they work, are you working with them on the drone? I can't really talk about our, okay. our relationships. That, that's fine. That's fine. So I have a couple of drones in my house. I have a DJI Phantom Vision Plus 2. I have a couple parrots, and then I have a racing drone, the ones that are not assisted at all. Right. And the ones I'm lucky to get to crash back into my big yard. Absolutely. Those are so much fun, but very dangerous. Right. Yes. So, we, we, so we define drone as autonomy. So in other words, you're not really flying it. It's at best fly by wire, but often it's just flying by itself. Um, so there's an old, there was the radio control airplane hobby world, which is all about flying and piloting, and that's your FPV racing drone. And that, that's been around for a long time. That's too. been around for 50 years. Exactly. Sure. It's getting better for sure, but that involves actual piloting. Super fun, but not really a drone. And then there's the ones with GPS that you mm -hmm. know can can fly on their own, and that's like your Phantom and our Solo. Right. So I, I like to take the Phantom to the beach. I think it's the fastest way to make friends at the beach. And enemies. And enemies, it is, yes. But then after a couple of weeks of playing with these things, they just sit in my closet. Yeah. Is there a data point that you can point at that says drones are not... A, a trend. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a fad. Uh, the, sort of the drone. Our drones hoverboards. Oh, yeah, fad. Sure. You know exactly. Um, so today, um, maybe tomorrow. I guess I may be pre-announcing here. Um, so the main problem with drones is that is that you know as as a fun thing, you know they're a toy, and then as video. It's like, okay, well, it's like a GoPro. How often does your Go GoPro come out? And the answer is, you know, how extreme is your life? You know? Right. Well, I have two kids, and I live in the middle of Michigan, so. So, so we, Not you know, so I found that I was having the same problem. I wasn't taking it out very often. Uh, and that's because I kind of suck. 
I'm flying. I suck at taking video. I, um, the kids hate it when I'm like, behind the camera. They want me to be out there playing with them. And so we, what we recognize is that what you really want is you want someone to take epic video of, the, of, of your life, but it not be you. So what we're releasing is a series of cinematic, what we call smart shots. And so you basically, I, so I'm playing soccer with my kids. Sure. And I want an ESPN quality video of this. Look, my kids don't play soccer with me very often. I got to grab this moment. Right, I get that. Right, so what the, what the drone does is it just moves up and down the field following me on this kind of cable, this virtual cable in the sky, tracking me the whole time, exactly like an ESPN, with all sorts of cinematic angles all kind of built in. We have multi-point cable cam and follow sure, me sure. And, and all this kind of stuff. And so we think that, you know, this is the golden age of personal storytelling. It's the golden age of personal video. You know, the selfie stick is, is just not long enough. Right, right, right. And so people who do want to tell their personal story better, but don't have the skills or patience to do it, we think that the autonomy of something like smart, smart shots are going, to, are going to keep them engaged. But you're right. I mean, how many people have GoPros in the world? It's clearly going to hit a limit. That's why we think that the commercial market is actually going to, hoverboards right. are not going to go to the commercial market. Sure. With the personal drones, it's going to be whoever happens to want aerial cinematic stories. Mm -hmm. But commercial drones are one to many. It's not that you don't have the one to one correspondence between operator and drone. You have fleets, you have swarms, you have these things like sprinklers out there, security cameras. They're just doing their job. Right, right. And sure. that's when, it, when the moment it becomes boring is when it becomes big and, and profitable. And profitable. So, what needs to happen to have drone deliveries become a thing? Well, drone deliveries are like the hardest thing you can do, right? It's, it's, you're flying over people, you're flying over urban areas, you're carrying a heavy weight, you know, you're in unknown space. Sure. So what I think you're going you're gonna to have um, is that, you know, rather than the, so the initial vision was, hey, dropping off, you know, cat food at your front door. Well, that's going to be the last thing that happens. Instead, what you're going to see is business to business, so warehouse to warehouse. Then you're going to have warehouse to, like, designated drop-off zone. So it could be, like, a seven, the roof of a 7-Eleven or maybe an apartment building, the roof of that. Cleared space, a drone zone, if you will. Um, no people are allowed on the box. It kind of lands on the bottom, top of the box. That's really interesting. It drops the thing in the box, then you type in a code later, and you get the thing out of the box. So that's known point A to known point B. That's, that's attainable, actually. You're going to need some regulatory permission. Where it gets really hard is when you want to be able to drop off to someone's individual home and you have to navigate telephone lines and trees and dogs sure. and small children. And that's a technical problem, as long, along with a regulatory problem. And I think that could be a decade or more. Really? So it, right now, what have the technologies been developed? We, we have op obstacle avoidance, right? No. In, in no shape, way, shape, or form? We do have it in some shape. Yeah. So th here's the thing. We can do obstacle avoidance. Everybody out there can do obstacle avoidance. And it works like 80% of the time. If we're, you know, sometimes it works 90% well, of the time. Sometimes I love my kids only 80% of the time. Yeah, exactly. But do you ever hit them with spinning propellers? Actually, I, one of them, yes, okay. one time. One time. So, so, you know, the problem is not, you know, can you do it? The problem is can you do it reliably? Every time, all, you know, everywhere. Mm -hmm. And until we have, I don't know, six nines, seven nines of reliability, the FAA is not going to trust us. We have to not only be as good as people, we need to be better than people at avoiding these things. And that is, the, you know, that environmental awareness, seeing, you know, sense and avoid, that is, that's a problem that the autonomous cars are trying to solve as well. That involves every sensor we have. It's computer vision, it's radar, it's LIDAR, it's sonar, it's infrared, it's 360 degree vision, it's artificial intelligence, machine sure. learning, it's the works. It's like the grand challenge of robotics. Sounds easy to me. Well, we're, we've got some. Um, we want to set expectations pretty low. Um, so we're going to like, okay, it's going to avoid the ground. That's a start. Sure. Now it's going to avoid like big things, like buildings and trees. That's pretty good as well. Um, now it'll avoid things in known areas. You know, maybe now it'll warn you, but maybe you're still going to have to do something about it. The day when we can avoid everything all the time, it's going to happen, but it's not going to happen soon. One more question on this. What's the hardest thing to avoid? Um, telephone lines are actually super hard to, uh, to avoid because they're quite thin and they're often sort of, there's a lot of background noise. They're often right up against trees oh, sure, and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, it turns out that when you, that when, as a human being, when you think you can spot telephone lines, what you can actually see is you can see the telephone pole, the other telephone pole, and you have the concept that between tele two telephone mm, poles, sure. there's this kind of, you know, there's this kind of elliptical line. Um, but you're using more than your vision to do that. You're actually using your, 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 the, the, knowledge, the concept of the telephone line. I get that. A drone has to be able to both be able to see it against the background, which is hard, you know, at night, in, in, in bad clover, and also be able to use its, use its, its uh, you know, the environmental uh, sure. cues 
to guess that there might be a line there. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an AI problem. That's fascinating. Thank you for talking about that. Now let's, let's move a little bit to the FAA. Yeah. There's a lot to talk about there. So they just recently made it uh, a, a regulation that you have to uh, register your drones, the consumers do. Was that the right thing to do? Yeah, well, we were on the task force, um, the department task force that, that, that led it. So we thought that was absolutely the right thing to do. So the FAA has got a really hard problem, which is their, their, their mandate is safety. Um, they don't really have an enforcement mechanism. And there's what we call, if you'll indulge me, mass jackassery. Sure. Basically, what you have is, is not like bad actors. What you have is people who just got a drone under the Christmas tree. You know, back in the old days before you could fly, you know, you had to like get, go to the flying field, get lessons, schooled. Now you get a drone under the tree, it's got a button on the app, you press go and it goes. And people don't know how close they are to an airport. They don't know that they're supposed to stay below 400 feet. And so we have to help them be responsible. They're not evil, they're just ignorant. So we have to use the smarts of our software to make, them, to make them more aware of what's safe. And one thing the FAA wants to do is, let's say somebody does something stupid. We want to know who, who they are. So if, if, the, um, if, an, if an airplane, if, if a, you know, a, a jetliner is landing and just spots a drone in the landing pattern, the FAA would like to be able to contact the manufacturers and say, who was flying there? And you know, we agreed and we told our customers that we would, uh, that we would help them uh, know that. Or if a drone lands on the White House, it should have a serial number. Obviously, bad actors are not going to put serial numbers on their drones, and bad actors are not going to register their drones. And there's ways to get around this. You can make your own, for example. But what we're not trying to stop is the bad people. We're trying to stop the good people who made a mistake and encourage them not to do that. So again. specifics here with, with 3D robotics, what are you guys... What have you already done, yeah. and what do you plan on doing to address this? Well, so another announcement we're making oh, this wow. week yeah. is, um, here, let me pull up uh, um, uh, the app. Um, so uh, we partnered with a company called airmap.io, uh, and so did DJI. And what we have is a now database of all the safe um, and, and, and unsafe areas in America. And um, I will show you. Uh, so we'll find out whether it is safe to fly right here. And so I'm going to call up the app. And the first thing it, it brings up here is a... Um, I mean, it's important to know we're in the middle of a uh, massive technology conference. So yeah, hey. Wi-Fi and 4G is fun here. That's right. What do you know? It's not safe to fly here. Let's not do it's that. It's not, yeah. No, and so what's, what's, what comes up is basically a map of your location with all sorts of circles. And so what this will show you is it shows you prohibited air, airspace, airports, um, national parks, heliports, infrastructure, which could be like Homeland Security stuff, something called TFRs, which is temporary flight restrictions for like an event, like a, like a football game or something like that. And it'll tell you, it'll, it'll tell you whether it's safe to fly here. And it, it'll also tell you where it would be safe to fly if it's not safe to fly. No, now, does, right now it's advisory. Okay, sure. Um, but, you know, it's just a, a line of code for us to make it obligatory. So, so what you're saying is right now it just tells the consumer that it's illegal to fly here, but does not restrict them from flying. Yeah, so DJI and we have a slightly different approach. DJI um, basically bricked the copters. And so, for example, in Washington, D.C., they said you can't fly within 30 miles of the White House. Well, they That's, kind of had a drone land on the White House lawn. Yeah, they did. So you didn't have that yet? No. Hopefully never. Hopefully never. Right. So basically, um, right now, if you have 6 million people in the D.C. area cannot fly their Phantom. Um, now, that, is, that is certainly ensures that no drones are flown um, you know, in, in that area. But we feel that at this stage, you know, people might have permission. For example, they might have what's called a COA or Section 333. And so we want to basically have them take responsibility. So if they choose to fly in a no-fly zone, we track that. We record that. And then if the FAA says some jackass did something bad, we have the data. What, one more thing about the FAA. Um, they took a long time to get to this. Did it hurt the U.S. drone industry? I don't think so. Um, I think they. I think they were. They, they, this is a tough problem, right? Um, you have, you know, so many constituencies. You've got, you know, the airline pilots and the helicopter pilots and the hobbyists and things like that. Um, they were moving slower than they are now. They've actually accelerated things quite a lot. And I'll tell you what. What happened? Um, the, the, the regs are basically going nowhere, and then we and the others put a million drones in the air, hmm. and that really got their attention. There's, sure. there's not, I mean, look, there's nothing good about a drone going behind you know, into the White House lawn, except for suddenly it accelerates the regulatory process. <laughs> right. So, so what we wanted, I mean, look, we have views about what would be good regulations, bad regulations, but what we want is clear regulations. 
And so what it was, it was ambiguous, and all that uncertainty was slowing things down. So now what we have is increasing certainty, and then once we get certainty, we'll work on the details. So we, for example, we want a micro category. Right now it's a small, which means under 55 pounds, and in commercial use, you'd still need a pilot's license. Um, we're arguing that you know, basically something like the size of your hand shouldn't be regulated like something 55 pounds. So we're arguing for a micro category of under 2 kilograms, mm. which would have a much lower regulatory barrier. And um, we're going through this process right now, and they're, and they're receptive. Well, Chris, you've been fascinating. This has been absolutely a blessing to me. So thank you so much for joining us. And you're actually...